Thank you for the uh, invitation. Uh, plastics and elastomers, this is a really big topic. Uh, well, I just uh, narrowed the topic to uh, plastics and elastomers for regenerative medicine. Uh, plastics and elastomers, they are polymers. The polymers are big molecules. Uh, people working on the polymers call the polymers micromolecules. <coughs> so the micromolecules are formed by combining large number of low molecular weight molecules together. So the low molecular weight molecule is called a monomer. So we put a lot of monomers together to form a long polymer chain, that's polymer, that's a micromolecule. While polymers have a lot of applications for packing, for closing like structural materials uh, to make electronic, electronics, like you see tap lights, computers, there are a lot of polymer parts over there. Uh, for medicine, for drug delivery, you see in, in, in your lab, in clinics, you see a lot of polymer-made medical devices. So the beauty of the polymer is that it can replace uh, some metals, glass, ceramics, even woods. Well, you see different kinds of polymers in, in, in clinics, in, in the uh, biomedical lab, well, these polymers can be divided into uh, elastomers and plastics. So what are elastomers? Elastomers, they're elastic polymers. Elastic means that you can stretch the polymer just like a rubber. So the rubbers, they are basically elastomers. For the plastics, they have less elasticity, and they usually, they are stiffer. They have higher stiffness, higher modulars than the elastomers. So these are the differences, the mechanical property difference between the elastomer and plastic. While in engineering, when we look at the mechanical properties of the material, so we do mechanical test to stretch the material and you look at the stress, stress strain behavior. You look at the curve. So usually for the elastomer, you see this kind of a curve. So this means that the elastomers can be stretched very long and they have low modulus. Well, for the plastics, there are two types of plastics. One is called brittle plastic. The other is tough plastic. So for the brittle plastic, you can see it's this curve, almost an inner line. Basically, you cannot stretch the brittle plastic for too long, actually very short, less than 10% of the strain. You can stretch it and very stiff, very high modulars for the brittle plastic. For the tough plastic, you can see a peak over here, and this peak is called yield point. Before the yield point, the stiffness is high, modulus is high, so after this yield point, you can see this kind of curve over here, this part, looks like an elastomer, but this is still plastic because it's stiff, has high modulus. Well, here are some examples of plastics used in medical field, like a polyacylin. Ultra high molecular weight polyacylin can be used to make artificial hips, and polystyrene in your lab, if you do cell culture, your flask, culture flux, uh, flasks, culture plates, 
they're made of polystyrene. Polypropylene, your centrifuge tube, it's made of polypropylene. Polyvinyl colloride, plumbing pipes, a lot of plumbing pipes made from polyvinyl colloride. Polycarbonate, it's a st stiff and a tough polymer, which can be used to make medical device. A lot of the uh, uh, drinking water bottle, if you put the hot water over there, that kind of water is made of, uh, bottle is made of polycarbonate. Also, we see uh, ABS. Uh, this is the high toughness, high impact resistance polymer, which is used to make car bomber. Uh, we see nylons a lot. So these polymers, polylactide, polygalactylide, polycarbonylactin, they are medical materials. They're used, they're approved by FDA for regenerative medicine, for drug delivery also. The elastomers are basically the rubbers, the rubbers used to make the car tire, and also the gloves. You wear gloves uh, in, in the lab and clinics. These gloves are basically elastomers. Well, for regenerative medicine, we use polymers. Why do we use polymers? So in a body, we have different tissues and organs. Some of them can regenerate effectively, but some of them cannot. For example, heart cannot regenerate effectively by itself. The damage to the heart is almost <coughs> permanent. But skin, if you have a small cut, it can you know, regenerate by itself. But if you have large trauma, it cannot regenerate effectively. So what happens if they cannot regenerate effectively? Uh, we need something to replace. We need a tissue organ substitutes to repair these damaged tissues or organs. But right now, people use autograft, the tissue organ from patient's own body, or allograft from donors. And they even use xenograft from animals, use mammoth implants like uh, artificial heart uh, made from uh, titanium alloys. The problems of these approaches are first, like mammoth implants, it's made of metals, right? It's not a live material, it stays forever over there. If you use xenograft, it's from animal. It's dangerous. If you implant animal tissue in the body, you see huge immune response. If you use autograft, the tissue organ from patient's body, you have limited number of uh, tissues or organs available. Allograft from donor you still have the limit. So people thought that we can regenerate these damaged tissues and organs. This is a tissue engineering regenerative medicine. So the definition is that we develop functional cell tissue and organ substitutes to repair, replace, or enhance biological function of the tissues and organs. Well, there are a lot of approaches for tissue engineering and regenerative medicine. I think people prefer this way. Uh, over here, this is a patient. We first take a piece of tissue from the patient to isolate the cells from the tissue. And later on, we will use the patient's own cells for tissue regeneration. So this could avoid Severe, a severe immune response. So once we have a lot of cells, we can combine the cells with the scaffold. The scaffold is three-dimensional uh, structure uh, material. So basically, people use polymer-based scaffold. And they combine the scaffold and the cells, and they use bioreactor to culture for a period of time to develop into a new tissue 
and then implant this tissue back into the patient. So this is the usual way. But over here, you can see that we need a scaffold, a three-dimensional scaffold, usually made from polymers, plastics, elastomers. So a lot of polymers we can use, the synthetic polymers like a polyester, degradable polyester, degradable polyurethanes like that. There, there are a lot other polymers we can use. Natural polymers like collagen, elastin, catalyst arginate, the natural polymers. But these polymers, no matter they're synthetic polymers or natural polymers, they can divide it into brittle plastic, tough plastics, and elastomers. For example, polylactic, polygalactylate, collagen, they are brittle plastics. Polycarbolactin, tough plastic. Elastomer, like degradable polyurethane, like elastin in the tissue, they're elastomers. So next, I'm going to give you some examples of uh, Senses and processing elastomers for cardiovascular tissue regeneration. So uh, we are we are interested in degradable polyurethanes. The, the polyurethanes you find in the market, they are mostly not degradable, so they are they are not uh, suitable for the uh, regeneration purpose. Uh, this is a general uh, census scheme for the polyurethanes. So we use. Uh, FDA approved components to make polyurethanes. So uh, these polyurethanes, they have a good biocompatibility once implanted in the body. So once we have the polyurethane, we want to use this polyurethane for uh, engineering, tissue engineering, blood vessel, and heart muscle, the muscle in the heart. So this is the example how we fabricate the tubular scaffold with blood vessel morphology. So this is the mold we use. In the mold, we have a mentor over here in order to make tubular structure. We put the polyurethane solution into this mold. The polyurethane is in DMSO. We use DMSO very often when we do cell culture. We restore, we restore our cells. We needed to use DMSO, add DMSO in the culture media, and then we freeze it. So we have the polymer solution in this mold, and we freeze the polymer solution at minus 20 or minus 80 degrees C. When we freeze the polymer solution, phase separation occurs. So before we freeze, there's only one phase. That's the polymer solution, single phase. After we freeze the polymer solution, two phase. We have polymer phase, we have sorbent DMSO phase. So DMSO, forms crystals after phase separation. And then we use ethanol to extract the DMSO. So after DMSO is gone, it left with pores in the polymer. So this way we can make porous scaffold with this tubular structure. We have pores over there. So we can change the fabrication condition to change the pore morphology and the pore size of the scaffold. So pores, these pores, they are over here, not this one, okay? They're over here on the wall. Well, these pores, through these pores, we can put our cells inside. The purpose is that we let the cells to grow inside to form a tissue engineering blood vessel. So we can put the cells inside. So these, these scaffolds, they, ha they have big pore size to allow the cells to grow inside. 
And this is the scaffold seated with cells. And we can suture the scaffold, the tubular structure. We can suture it, and then we can implant over here to replace part of the rat aorta. So after eight weeks from angiogram, you can see the blood vessel is not blockaded. The blood vessel is, you can, uh, there's blood flow over there. There's no blockage. And the overview of the tissue engineering, the blood vessel. And then we can also use the elastomer, the polyurethane, to engineer heart muscle. So in this case, we need to fabricate the solid scaffold. We don't need a tubular scaffold anymore. We need a solid scaffold. So we just put the polyurethane solution in this mold without mentor inside. And we, we, we did the same process, made the scaffold. And take a look at over here. So this is the solid scaffold. So you can compress and you can stretch. Very, very flexible. And this is the nature of the elastomer. So then we implant it to the rat. First, we make a myocardial infarction. And then two weeks after, we implant the scaffold over here in the rat. And after eight weeks, you can see that the thickness of the muscle we implanted with, uh, with polyurethane elastomer is higher than the control, right? And if we look at the heart function, you can see that the scaffold implantation improved heart function compared to control. So in previous examples, we used the porous scaffold with big pores. But if you look at the collagen in the heart, it's fiber structure. So we need to make the scaffold with similar morphology as a native to heart tissue. And then probably now we, we can stimulate the tissue regeneration. This is fiber scaffolds. Uh, we use the electrospinning technique. Uh, Jet introduced the electrospinning. I'm not going to repeat it. So we used our elastomer and made this scaffold over here. Beautiful fibers, but the problem is that the pore size is too small. So the cells cannot grow inside easily to grow into a three-dimensional scaffold. Now we then develop a technique which uh, we use the electrical field to make nanofibers, and at the same time, we let the cells to spray on the high voltage into the nanofibers. By this way, when we make nanofibers, we mix with cells together. And this is pretty quick. After only 45 minutes, we can make a tissue construct with 200 micron thickness. If you look at the uh, live cells over here, you can see the uh, uh, live cells along the thickness direction. If we do mechanical tests, we can find that our tissue constructs have the same mechanical properties as the native pig heart tissue. So basically, we can use the fiber scaffold to mimic the mechanical properties of the native heart tissue. So uh, I'm going to go through this quickly. So we can process the plastics for drug and a gas release. So this is the technique we used uh, in the lab to quickly fabricate drug-loaded uh, PLGA uh, microspheres. We use, again, use electrical field to do this. So in this case, we fabricated PLGA microspheres to release BFGF to stimulate tissue angiogenesis. So we have a co-share structure microspheres. This is a BFGF core. This is a PLGA shell. It's a co-share structure. And you can see that we can allow the BFGF to release over four weeks. When we implant, you can see the, mature, the, 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 the functional blood vessel formed with blood cells inside. And we also made the PLGA microspheres 
that can release oxygen. Because in the dam a lot of damaged tissue, uh, in the t these tissues, say, ischemic environment, low oxygen environment, if you uh, transplant the cells over there, a lot of cells die. While we use microspheres to release oxygen, Again, we can, we can control the oxygen release over two weeks. So, yeah, that's it. Or, I, I saw the sign over time, so just to stop over here. <laughs> yeah.